So I'd like to introduce you to the next two speakers or presenters. Some of you uh, were lucky enough to experience their joint research yesterday evening first hand, or I should rather say first bodied. It's uh, Susanne Schmidt based in Munich and Laura Young based in Berlin. They have joined together, so it is um, on the one hand an anthropologist and ethnographer, and on the other hand a curator and dancer. So in terms of professional affiliations, uh, not at all the common uh, companion species. Um, they will give us a deeper in insight into their joint research, and one of the many uh, things I'm interested in will be how they found out about their joint interest and how did they actually meet and become a team. Is the mic on? Can you hear me okay? Is oh. my, yes. Good. Perfect. Thank you so much. What a ride. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I know we have the job or the opportunity now to shift atmosphere a little bit. And luckily, that's what we do anyways. <laughs> so, as we begin, I ask you to please close your eyes. And notice the chair that you're sitting on. You can also touch it a little. Sense what it's been made of. There's plastic and further down a bit of metal that feels cool to the touch. Who has that chair been made for? What kind of body? And now, please raise a hand in front of your face. Bring the palm to the inside and bring it close, close to your nose, and smell. What can you perceive? Is it a bit, yeah, mine, mine, mine too, and a bit sweaty because of all the excitement going on in the room? but maybe also some other traces sticking on your hand, your soap or your, your hand lotion. And now, drop your hand if you want, and pay attention to the sense and the smell around you, the whole room. Maybe you can smell the other people in the room, other humans or the carpet. If you want, you can leave your eyes closed. You can open them, that's perfectly up to you. We are Susanne Schmidt and Laurie Young. Together we form a tandem called How to Not Be a Stuffed Animal, Kein Ausgestopftes Tier Sein, <laughs> Moving Museums of Natural History Through Multi-Species Choreography. Um, laying there is our colleague Diane from Sydney, who we are also very grateful for because she allowed us to show some of the footage and, and pictures we took of her when she was testing one of the walks. The basic starting point of our work is that we come to museums of natural history, to zoological collections, having the privilege of gazing at dead animal bodies, of specimens of other than human remains. I think there are very many different ways of addressing that and naming that, and then that unfolds quite different sets of stories. Um, and the very body that people bring to the museum, that situation is the kind of tool, it's the kind of situation that we work with. Because when we talk about animals, humans are always implicated in that. And that also means the whole human sensorium, the whole human experience, and that of course is a wide range of possible experiences and histories on the human side as well. We use a staple of the museum, the audio guide. We appropriate it, and we create immersive audio walks. 
And we ask participants who use them, who participate in them, to move through the museum in a quite unconventional way. We work in museums of natural history worldwide, and our key museum sites are Freiburg, the Museum Mentor of Natur there, the Munich Hunting, the Munich Hunting and Fishery Museum, quite a different take on taxidermy as trophy, and other places to go from there, I'm sure. Um, there's Iziko South African Museum in Cape Town, the Chicago Field Museum, and we are coming back and today talking about our work uh, at the Australian Museum in Sydney. Um, so we were asked to talk about how we actually came together um, we have um, two, uh, I think, quite entangled, but still different backgrounds, yeah. actually. So I'll talk a little bit about how I came here. Um, I'm not a curator, I'm a choreographer and dancer um, in contemporary dance, and um, interested in the representation of unauthorized histories. So part of my um, fascination and love of natural history museums came about with the question of the gaze and being a performer and being on stage and who am I allowing to look at me and what am I inviting? Um, so for me, one of the most perfect uh, um, tools to talk about that was the diorama, which is inherently theatrical and, and also talks about reality and fiction. How do we erase human traits so that we have this supposed perfect version of nature. And um, I was very drawn into this world of the diorama. So in 2010, actually at the Naturkunde Museum here in Berlin, I created a life-size diorama, which was a speculative future of climate change in 200 years in Germany. So I created a landscape of climate change in 200 years, where I was performing inside the diorama, and it was also set up as a three-week installation. Um, in my research, um, of course there was movement research, but in my research I was also asking zoologists, um, climate change experts, diorama designers, uh, painters, about how one could go about building this very large set. Um, and this sort of introduced me into this world of natural sciences and its kind of research that can be brought into, into my work. Mm -hmm. And I am an anthropologist by training and ethnographer. Ethnographer is what anthropologists basically do. We spend a lot of time with people and whatever they are entangled with, their stories, objects, um, histories, possibilities, <laughs> futures. And uh, a while back I did my PhD with a sensory ethnography of the Deutsche Hygiene Museum in Dresden, which is, I'll just call it a medical history museum, it's so much more, but for the sake of, <laughs> uh, for the sake of time I'll just, uh, just leave it there. And I worked with people who actually work at the museum spending a lot of time in front of their closets in the morning, figuring out how you create a museum body, being the person that's going to be looked at all day, looking at contemporary discourse and practice of sensory exhibition making and how that all uh, kind of in the end in, entangles in this kind of social aesthetics of a place and how, what that actually means for uh, both people who work there and, and visitors. And we came together in Wieselhövede, which is, <laughs> which has a lot of horses, uh, which is in Niedersachsen, I think, in the framework of a Volkswagen Stiftung initiative, which was called Arts and Science in Motion. And they uh, invited a range of artists, scholars, unexpectedly, I think, for some, a lot of people who were actually already working the very boundaries between those fields. And at that network meeting, as you can tell, we obviously figured out that we had <laughs> a couple of interests in common and um, applied um, to do our research slash creation work um, mm. together. I'd also like to add that we are uh, working with Anna Lippert from the Department of Cultural Anthropology in Freiburg, who's looking uh, ethnographically also at the very boundary-making processes that go with those arts and science uh, initiatives. So we are not being framed as a, so much as a museum residency project, but rather as an arts and science initiative, and I think that's quite important also uh, just for the logistics of the project and also because we talked about that a little bit yesterday. 
Yeah, so it's interesting how we've mentioned about how artists may or may not be included in different in infrastructures. And part of the challenge, um, just to talk a bit about infrastructure, part of the challenge for us in accessing field sites is who do we ask? Um, if, a, if, a, if a museum does not have an artist's sort of a specific artist uh, program, then it's not really clear how we go about contacting the institutions. So it's very interesting that a lot of the networks that we have or the people that we contacted is kind of through warm contacts. Um, it's very often that if an artist might call a larger institution and you might not be so well known that the email kind of gets pushed down the list. Um, so a lot of the ways that we've approached people has been through warm contact. So it's also interesting that it's been very different. At the Sydney Museum, our first contact was Cameron Slater from the um, Amphibious Collection. Um, in in uh, Cape Town, we are being brought in by the Educational Department, Production Aran. Um, and in Chicago, we are being brought in by the Indigenous North American um, Cultural Collection. So they're very, as you can tell, they're very broad and far-reaching um, departments. And maybe this is telling about how um, artists might have to negotiate these kinds of very large institutions. So our project subtitle is Moving Natural Histories, History Museums Through Multi-Species Choreography. And um, so we really do use a combined approach of both movement design and storytelling. I think the, the term multi-species has been brought up this morning also by court, um, asking how we can actually enter into multi-species responsibility. And this is very much, so what's the actual uh, organ that we get, well, organ, but <laughs> situation, however you want it. So how do we actually enter into being responsive uh, to uh, the experience that, that happens upon us. And that's, I think, a common question. Multi-species studies in general are an approach that combines, I think, biological and ethological knowledge, storytelling, ethnographic approaches, and it's in itself a so-called interdisciplinary field, or maybe just a new field. Um, who knows? And I think what's important uh, to add is that we don't divide labor between us. We do the exact same thing. A lot of people think mm -hmm. I do the sure. script and Laurie then dances or something. It's, it's been mm -hmm. quite, uh, quite interesting actually to, uh, this is not at all what we do, but we really shared our research practices and mm -hmm. movement practice and sensory approaches. Yeah, yeah. It's very, I feel like it's a very fluid kind of collaboration. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, so again, just to give you the framework of one of the tangible products, I guess, that we're doing are these audio walks. So these are immersive audio walks where we ask. So one more thing that's also very important to know is that these audio walks are free. They're for everyone to use, which means it's for a general public. It's not for movement practitioners. It's not for artists. Or of course, it is open to, but not specific to. So we have to think about different kinds of bodies as well, and different um, abilities. Um, one thing that I'm really interested in in this kind of work is that, yes, we have the listener who is activating the walk, but we also have the viewers. So there's going to be people who will be watching mm -hmm. people enact and activate and move in the space in different ways. So I feel like this also gives a performative element to, um, to the space. So we have this sort of triangulation of different ways of looking. The, the viewer, uh, so excuse me, the listener, who is looking at the objects, following body instructions. And then we have the general public who is not listening, who is then witnessing all of these different commotions happening in, in the place. Mm -hmm. um, to give you some background how we work, um, we work with different kinds of narratives. So we often go into the museum and we observe the, we work with a permanent exhibition because uh, we need that kind of stability and longevity. So we go into an exhibition space and often we just observe and we sit and we look at the visitors and see their pathways, see how they move, um, observe the kind of decisions that the exhibition design might, might hold. Um, we then 
ask um, access to museum staff, so we'll ask, we'll talk to biologists, we'll talk to security guards, we'll talk to um, definitely taxidermists, as that is one of our key um, subject matters. Um, we'll talk to conservationists, to the cleaners, to really get a sense of this, this field. Um, one thing I'd also like to, and so when, once we've sort of looked at this, this plethora of information, a narrative starts to emerge, whether that's a narrative that has already been proposed by the museum, such as extinction or biodiversity, we might want to um, add or irritate or um, make another proposition that might go towards this narrative. Um, one of the things that is very important and that's been talked about a lot in the last talk is sound yeah. design. So these are audio walks, and um, this is also one of our, f we're working sort of on multiple scripts at the same time, so this is one of the first ones, and it's still in post-production. Um, we also are based here, and this is, this is in Australia, in Sydney. This also means that it was a big learning curve in that originally we were going to work with our sound designer here in Germany, but it made absolutely no sense because we really needed somebody in situ on site to be in the space, to be embodied in the space, to understand the parkour, and to also um, access his local knowledge. He's, you know, he's from Sydney, he understands how the birds fly, he's part of the landscape. So it was very important for us to work with, uh, his name is Trevor Brown, but he's also a new partner. So um, we're in an ongoing discussion about sound design and it's still in the final production. So as we listen to um, the excerpts of the audio, I, I ask you to bear that in mind. Mm -hmm. Next slide. <coughs> Uh, shall I? So this is the entrance to the Australian Museum. Um, it begins, this is the very beginning of the walk, just to situate you a little bit in, into the realm. Um, it starts with the acknowledgement that we are situated on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. And this is very important as we talk about where the actual physical museum is situated on what land and what body we come to in this land. And this is, an, this is something that we bring up throughout the walk, that we are actually on Aboriginal land and what kind of privilege we have in being in this space. We introduce the idea of body instructions and, and sensory perceptions. And we also introduce the connection between the visitor human body, so this living, breathing body, and the body of the architecture of the museum. So the museum has a body itself. It has a ventilation system. It has a whole circulatory system. So it's trying to situate the listener inside this space with their own body. Shall I play it? Yeah. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present of the Eora Nation, and I extend that respect to other indigenous people who are present. We are about to embark on an experience where you will be guided by your headphones. We will be asking you to move around the museum in a sometimes unconventional manner. You are allowed to do so. Let's do a sound check first. This is your left speaker. This is your right speaker. Please put your device in your pocket so that your hands are free. There is a railing ahead of you. Place your left hand on the railing and slowly walk up the ramp. Follow the rhythm of my footsteps. The metal feels cool to the touch. When you have reached the top of this ramp, Look for the next railing. It should be on your right side. Walk there now. Place your right hand on the railing and keep walking up to the top of the slope.
You are now entering the atrium foyer of the museum. Take four steps into the atrium. Stay here. Breathe and listen. This used to be a car park. The gray carpet you see was once asphalt. Before that, forest. The wall on the right side of you was the outside of the original museum. The skeleton of this museum started being built in 1827 by colonists with the idea of procuring many rare and curious specimens of natural history. There are millions of preserved organisms housed here, all arranged by and kept for humans to experience and research. So much labor went into the building of these walls. Horses, humans, laboring, sweating. They have passed on, but you are alive. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to just give you some excerpts in a sort of a, the chronological order that it occurs. Yeah, so it should be added that the actual walk is 50 minutes long, right? So we really just present you with some glimpses into what we do. So we picked um, some examples that we hope can help us to, to tell you how we actually work and approach things. Um, so here, we actually, we've moved up in the museum. We took the elevator. We're on a different floor now. And we're entering um, a space. And I will just for a short moment uh, show you what it looks like to follow a person who does the walk. What we were interested in here is um, while the museum is obviously advertising or being made visible through taxidermy, there's also a lot of just small, tiny, neglected forms of life in the space. And we were really interested in who those were. So we um, teamed up and interviewed the arachnologist, the spider expert at the uh, museum to, uh, um, to, to figure out who or what that could be and uh, how they got to the museum and what their living conditions were. Um, so um, this is um, what we then developed, just again a small excerpt. Stand in the corner and breathe. You are turning into a being from a family older than the dinosaurs, more than 130 million years. You are leaving mammal life behind. And you are getting smaller. Cower down to the ground as you start shrinking. Your tissues, your molecules are absorbing the shape and capacities of other living beings in this room. Your bones dissolve. The hair on your skin becomes a new sensory organ. Softly, low on the skin of one of your extremities. As a new being you are becoming, your world depends on vibration. You feel movement. You feel vibration on your hairy surface. You stay in a place that you know. You like your corner. You need it. Keep breathing. Touch the ground. Can you feel the museum vibrate with the Morse code that was sent in the beginning of this walk? Can you feel the other animals, human or non-human, move, approach, and go away? Your mammal skeleton morphs to the outside into a twofold cast. Your extremities become eight. Your blood turns blue. Are you stable? Are you swaying?
So that was one of the kind of somatic experiences that we kind of ask people to participate in. So they're actually situating, they begin as human and we ask them to morph into another kind of creature and to really do that physically. So you're asked to crouch down, find a corner, be in part of a museum that you normally wouldn't be in and to um, enact these instructions. We have another one uh, that we were working with, which is the sperm whale, which is in the huge, hanging in the big hall, huge. Um, and here is another example of this. And again, the sound um, is not in its final version. Look up towards the skeleton of the sperm whale and walk along its length, beginning at the mouth. You are walking through one of the largest mammals on Earth. Passing through the jaws and teeth of this carnivore, you glide down its gullet and through to the rib cage. Keep walking, and you are passing along its spine through to the tip of its tail. Look back from where you came. Take a spot on a bench and lie down with your head pointing towards the whale's head and your feet towards its tail. If there are no benches available and you feel able to, lie on the ground. If this is not available to you, then sit on the stairs. In 1871, it seems she had a tussle with a whaling boat and after weeks dead at sea, ended up on the beach of Wollongong. The oil of the whale was taken first. Afterwards, it was cut up into pieces, skinned and fleshed to the bone. Too heavy to be brought intact, the whale was carted in four loads and reassembled outside the museum building. For 100 years, this sperm whale has been hung on display. It floats above you by the grace of iron braces and hinges drilled into the ceiling of the museum. The sperm whale never drinks. In fact, it's considered a desert animal. But its body is made of 97% water. Yours is made of 65%. Close your eyes. Remember your body as a spirit level from the beginning of this walk. But now feel your liquids floating upwards and your body pulling downwards. The air around you turns into water. Your body is one big oxygen tank. Your heartbeat drops to 10 beats per minute. You perceive your world through sound. You are sending out pulses of sound to navigate your surroundings. If a sperm whale is vulnerable, ill, hurt. Other whales form a pattern around to protect her. Right now, you are the one in the middle of this constellation. It was 1853 and back on land, Australia had been hit by the... Okay, we'll just stop that there. Mm -hmm. So some of the things, of, of course, we're asking is how do we place ourselves, literally, how do we position ourselves in the museum? So inviting somebody to lie on the ground um, generally doesn't cause too much fuss to museum guards, but of course, we never feel able to make these shifts. Mm -hmm. So just inviting somebody to, to lie on the ground is, it allows the visitor to experience these artifacts, these specimens in new ways. Yeah. Um, this is just a small GoPro excerpt of Diane um, going through the museum um, in one of the more, in one way, extreme. And it's interesting, as, as we were trying to think about what kind of body um, movements one could do in the museum, I, at first I was thinking running and screaming and jumping, and then it didn't sit right. Did it feel right? I 
love that. <laughs> idea of different ways of moving in the space. But what I was saying is, you know, at the, at be in the beginning we were thinking of creating quite dynamic movement um, um, scores. And then I realized that it doesn't, I felt like we realized it didn't take much to, to do something that felt really radical in the museum, like looking from down or looking from up or just making these subtle shifts in the body somehow seem to open up all of these different possibilities. Yeah. Can I add just a little yeah. thing? Also, when we, when we looked again at, uh, at that footage, it just strikes me every single time how this is a room talking about the loss of biodiversity and the sixth great extinction that we're currently experiencing. And what's actually disruptive in this space is a lady crawling a little. <laughs> Just to think about that and what it actually, like how codified and uh, what actually museums are actually able to bring across about how dramatic things that are happening really are. If that's what's drawing the attention, that's just a very interesting observation, I find. Okay, so for the um, almost the last slide, again, we're, uh, we stay in the same hall, and I just um, want to say a tiny little bit uh, about uh, another important resource for our research. We do archival research. Obviously, we depend on, on, on sound archives a lot, also on video. Um, here, uh, we're, we're dealing, we're engaging with the thalassin, uh, which also Janet talked about yesterday, which is a hugely, well, iconic extinct animal, I think, in the Australian uh, context. Um, there's very little footage or possibility um, that we actually have to access what kind of it, uh, its well, form of life could have been or uh, way of life. Um, we found a little bit of video footage, and it's uh, from Thylacin in captivity. And we can just have a look at that and then maybe hear from, from Laurie and the excerpt. We'll we never see the movements of a thylacine in the wild. No, just the video. Lack of space produces... We'll never see the movements of a thylacine in the wild. That's okay. Lack of... We'll never see the movements <laughs> of a thylacine in the wild. Like you need more of my voice. Yeah. <laughs> And this is about repetitive movement, and so just take it as a theatrical <laughs> element. Shall we play it, or do you want to say something? Um, I might just say mm -hmm. something quickly, that's okay. So we picked up on the narrative of extinction, <laughs> And um, we also observed that the tendency of the public was um, that they wouldn't even really register that it was an extinct animal, and there was sort of passing by, and there was almost dismissive of this of this uh, of this object animal. Um, and in fact, something that we noticed is that most, even at an interest, people that are interested in an object, they might not stay for more than 40 seconds. It's very quick. There's a, a very strong sort of consumerist habit of going in the space. So we're, we're actually, and this might be important to think about, um, we also contextualize our walks as, as attention, as mindful attention to the space. Um, so we really ask in, in this particular instance that the public really dwell and gaze at this. Um, we were also interested in how one can apprehend these taxidermy beings in other ways through an embodied experience. So the thylacine, for example, we ask the viewer to come really close to the glass and to slowly trace the outline um, of the animal. While, while they're tracing the outline, we give some information about the animal, its history, and how taxidermy is made. Um, and in this way, they get to be in very close proximity to the specimen, and they have to take their time. It's very demanding. Um, 
So we have tracing the outline of this extinct animal, but we also play with the idea of re-embodying the extinct animal through anatomy and movement, which is why we were looking at the footage of the video. So as an example, in the spider here, we asked the visitor to imagine elongating their nose, pulling back their eyes, and opening their mouth to a full 130 degrees, like a thylacine. So we have lost the thylacine, we have also lost their movements, we have lost their senses as well. This is all what makes up this being. But how can these behaviors still be relived through us that are living today? And this is, was one of the tasks we mm -hmm. brought to ourselves. So just um, to end then with, because this is so much about co-presence, um, just to end with a quote from Haraway. The task is to make kin in lines of inventive connection as a practice of learning to live and die well with each other in a thick present. Our task is to make trouble, to stir up potent response to devastating events, as well as to settle troubled waters and rebuild quiet places. In fact, staying with the trouble requires learning to be truly present. Thank you.